Now, if I read a little more this morning, would you be like I am at night when I'm in a good book and I hardly ever read anything I don't think's good? When I reach that little sleepy place and it's so good, I just press right past it. And the sleepiness is gone because I'm interested. I stay at it. If I want to read something to get sleepy, then I'll read something technical, something dull, you know. And uh, that's, that's very, um, it's very rare for me that I can find anything dull because I'm interested in just about everything that lands in print. But uh, once in a while, I can get something that, you know, after a while I get asleep, sleeping, I can put it aside. But I want you to listen to what I've written, and I'll be uh, commenting uh, somewhere throughout, uh, uh, throughout the reading of, of some of these words. It, would, it wouldn't take me two minutes, I don't think, or three or five to read what I have written. But I did want to beg of you, your hearing and your earnestness. Several weeks ago, I spoke of the enigma of Hebrews. Well, there are more mysteries in Hebrews. He, Hebrews, the book of Hebrews, is indeed an enigmatic writing. Perhaps the first mystery that we discuss is who wrote the book. The author doesn't reveal his or her name. If it is a woman, then you have your reason, most probably, for why the book does not reveal the author. Could have been Priscilla. And she is thought to be a good possibility because the thought pattern is that of Paul. It is Pauline. And if it be Pauline, it had to be somebody who was under his teaching. Indeed, the letter got into the canon because it was Pauline. That is, not Pauline feminine, but Pauline, belonging to Paul. Thirteen letters they knew that he wrote, but nobody knows who wrote wrote Hebrews. So how do you know that? All the research and all the history. Every Bible student and scholar up here knows that from any introduction or any school class. Because the early church fathers admittedly said, we don't know who wrote it. And one of the great church fathers said, only God knows. So there's a great mystery. I don't believe it to be Paul himself, simply because of a place in there, in the early part of the reading, where it says... um, uh, well, in, for, I just say because of internal evidence, it doesn't seem to be him, but it does seem to be Pauline. And of course, that's the reason why it was accepted into the canon in the fourth century. I'm amazed that Mark ever got into it. John Mark, he wrote the gospel. He was not an apostle, but thank God somebody knew it was inspired. How do we really know that this is inspired? The Westminster Confession tells us how we know. We know by the witness of the Holy Spirit. We know by the voice of God. And as these letters would be read, as these scriptures would be read, God would witness to the hearts of the saints. And so they would say, that's an inspired piece. And it, by God's grace, was received, was universally agreed by the fourth century that Matthew, the revelation, was indeed the word of God. Now, that's a mystery who wrote the book. And God will reveal it to us one of these days. And the other enigma or mystery that I spoke of this previous Sunday was the mystery of something left out. Well, the writer was left out. You might say this is another mystery of something left out. And what is left out is the words of the apostles and of Jesus. The writer never appeals once to the words of Jesus or the teachings of the apostles, even though he was acquainted with the gospel himself, as found in chapter 4 and verse 2. Of course, we answered that, or tried to. We said that what was needed in terms of these Hebrew Christians in Rome most properly, properly was an objective reference that all could agree. You and I have an objective reference. We call it Genesis to Revelation. They did not have Matthew to Revelation, but they did have Genesis to Malachi. That was the Bible they carried, so to speak, under their arm. They didn't carry it under their arm because it was in scrolls. It wasn't printed up like this. But the Bible 
that was commonly known and agreed upon as the Word of God was Genesis to Malachi. And we said that the writer to the Hebrew appeals for all of his proof texts to the Word of God as then received, Matthew through Malachi. And if they could hear Moses and the prophets, then they could hear God's Word through the writer himself or God's word through the apostles, or God's word through what he's really driving for, if they believe Moses and the prophets, they would believe the one he spoke through in the last day, his son. That's what he's driving for. Jesus told us it was this way and that this was the principle because he said, as he gave the story of Dives and Abraham, he said, uh, had Abraham saying there at the last, when he said, oh, please send somebody to wake up my brothers, send him back, send Lazarus back from the dead. And Jesus said, if they will not believe, or Abraham said, if they will not believe Moses and the prophets, meaning Genesis to Malachi, that he said, they will not believe one though he be sent from the dead. So the writer, we attempted to answer that question. But there's another mystery in this great letter. That mystery has something in common with the first two. Something is left out. And left out, I think, on purpose. Mystery one is the absence of the name of the writer. Mystery two is the absence of the apostolic teaching and the teaching of Jesus. Mystery three, and here is the point of my sermon today, is the absence of any reference to the temple. The sacrificial system is referred to over and over again, the mosaic economy, but always in relation to the tabernacle, never to the temple. Yet, the temple was at that time the place of sacrifice and offering. We, again, by internal evidence, internal evidence do not believe that sacrificial system was destroyed uh, as it was in 70 AD. Therefore, we place the writing of the, of the book of Hebrews before the destruction of Jerusalem. And as he writes and as he reads with them, it is a system that is apparently still in effect. But he does not say temple. He refers only to the tabernacle. Now, to underscore this, just turn with me to the book of Hebrews and, and uh, get this more firmly in mind. 8-2, chapter 8, second verse and the fifth verse. Second verse is preceded by verse 1, which says, Now the things which we have spoken, this is the sum. We have such an high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heavens, a minister of the sanctuary of the true tabernacle. No word about temple. Which the Lord pitched and not man. Then in verse 5, who served unto the example and shadow of heavenly things as Moses was admonished of God when he was about to make the tabernacle. Chapter 9, and this is replete with references only to the tabernacle. Verse uh, 2, for there was a tabernacle made. Verse 3, and after the second veil, the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all. Verse 6, now when these things were thus ordained, the priest went away into the first tabernacle, accomplishing the service of God. Verse 8, the Holy Spirit, this signifying that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest, while as the first tabernacle was yet standing. Verse 11, but Christ being come and high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building. You'll find a reference in verse 21. You'll find a reference to the tabernacle in verse 11 or chapter 11, verse 9. And finally, in the 13th chapter and the 10th verse, we have an altar whereof they have no right to eat which serve the tabernacle. The writer is unknown, probably for a good reason. The apostolic teaching, teachings are absent, probably to enable all to reason from an objective reference of common consent. The only Bible, Genesis through Malachi. 
But why is there no reference to the temple then standing? Let me suggest. Let me suggest that any reference to the temple is excluded because the temple itself is a departure from the divine ideal. The reason the temple is not mentioned because, is because the temple itself is a departure from the divine idea. The divine ideal. In the New Testament, this seems to be the reason why Stephen's message was so resisted and rejected and caused his very stoning because he spoke that the temple was not the perfect will of God. Acts 7, read with me, 44 through 54. Our fathers, Stephen said, and he's made it fine in all of his speech until he gets right here. And right after he says these words, people become wrathful so much so that they take Stephen's life. I want to tell you ahead of time, that they may not have proved to Stephen, but Jesus did. Because as he died, Jesus stood, thereby commending Stephen for what he's about to say and what I'm about to share with you, which Stephen says that the temple is a departure from the divine ideal. It was not God's perfect will. Our fathers had the tabernacle of witness in the wilderness as he had appointed, speaking unto Moses, that he should make it according to the fashion that he had seen. The tabernacle, that's what he points to. So does the writer to the Hebrews. Which also our fathers that came after brought in with Joshua, it should read, into the possession of the Gentiles, whom God drave out before the face of our fathers unto the days of David who found favor before God and desired to find a tabernacle for the God of Jacob. But Solomon built him an house. But Solomon built him a temple. How be it the Most High, and here's where the stir comes, the Most High dwelleth not in temples made with hands, as saith the prophet, that was Nathan, Heaven is not my throne, God said, or heaven is my throne, and earth is my footstool. And what house will you build me, saith the Lord, or what is the place of my rest? Hath not my hand made all these things? But you insisted on a house. Ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised and hard in ears, ye do always resist the Holy Ghost as your fathers did, so do ye. Which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted? Of course, he's really in trouble now. And they have slain them which showed before of the coming of the just one, of whom ye have been now the betrayers and murderers, who have received the law by the disposition of angels and have not kept it. When they heard these things, they were cut to the heart and they gnashed on him with their teeth. I like the next words. I hadn't planned to read them, but I like them and I'll read them. But he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God. Again, the essence is that the temple was a departure from the divine ideal. The Lord intended for the dwelling place of His presence to be the tabernacle in the wilderness. But He intended for it to give way to the dwelling place of men. Paul put it this way, Christ in us, the hope of glory. The tabernacle was symbolic of impermanency. The temple was symbolic of something permanent and something rigid. And that was contrary to what God wanted to get across to the people. He wanted them to know that he was interested in the barriers being torn down. Also, the the tabernacle was the symbol of the pilgrim nature of God's people. But that isn't the most important symbol. It was that, sure, and we mustn't forget that. But the stronger symbolism has to do with the nature of divinity rather than the nature of man. 
And the nature of this God was that he wanted to live in the hearts of men. And that he wanted the tabernacle to be a temporary dwelling place. Indeed, that's what a tent suggests. A house of God made of wood or of stone is not the proper symbol. But the tabernacle was. When David wanted to build God a house for he himself now lived in a fine palace of cedar, Nathan was sent by God to David to declare. And these are the words that uh, Stephen refers to. But if you want to see them in their original context, look in Second Samuel, the seventh chapter. For David had declared unto Nathan what was his intent, and it sounded good. And Nathan, in fact, said, Go and do all that is in thy heart, for the Lord is with thee. But God spoke to him after that and said something different. And it came to pass that night that the word of the Lord came unto Nathan, saying, Go tell my servant David, don't you do it. Thus saith the Lord, Shalt thou build me an house uh, an house for me to dwell in? Whereas I have not dwelt in any house since the time that I brought up the children of Israel out of Egypt, even to this day, but have walked in a tent and in a tabernacle. Oh, my. Of course, in that same chapter, he informs David that he will let Solomon build that house that David requested. But the Lord makes it clear that it will be a departure from the divine ideal. David himself, as king of Israel, was a departure from the divine ideal. But the people would have it so, for they wanted a king like all the other, nat- like all the other nations. God wanted a theocracy. He wanted to speak through his prophets. But the people didn't want it this way. They wanted a king. And so the Lord granted the request of the people because of their obstinacy. They want a temple. They want a king. And it is not God's ideal and it is not his perfect will. The matter of kingship is spoken of in 1 Samuel, the 8th chapter. In fact, earlier than that, it is uh, quite an experience to see Samuel pleading for those who wanted a king, the very children of Israel itself. In fact, Samuel says, I'm against it. And the Lord says in the earlier chapter, he says, Samuel, you're going to have to give them You're going to have to give him a king. And he says to Samuel, now Samuel, don't feel bad. Here it is. It's in the eighth chapter. He said, but the thing displeased Samuel when they said, give us a king to judge us. And Samuel prayed unto the Lord. And the Lord said unto Samuel, now listen to this, hearken unto the voice of the people in all that they say unto thee. For they have not rejected thee, but they have rejected me that I should not reign over them. They want a king because they, in fact, do not want my will. Therefore, give them one. So he chose Saul. And then he chose David. But it was a departure from what God really wanted. He said, but tell them something else. Tell them what they're going to get with a king. Let him have that king, but tell him this goes with it. 10th verse, 8th chapter, 1 Samuel. Samuel told all the words of the Lord unto the people that asked of him a king. And he said, this will be the manner of the king that shall reign over you. He will take your sons and appoint them for himself, for his chariots, and to be his horsemen. And some shall run before his chariots. Demeaning, wouldn't you say? He will appoint them captains over thousands and captains over fifties and will set them to ear his ground and reap his harvest and to make his instruments of war and instruments of his chariots. And he will take your daughters to be confectionaries and to be cooks and to be bakers. 
And He will take your fields and your vineyards and your olive yards, even the best of them, and give them to His servants. And He will take the tenth of your seed and of your vineyards and give to His officers and to His servants. And He will take your men servants and your maid servants and your goodliest young men and your asses and put them to His work. He will take the tenth of your sheep and ye shall be His servants. And ye shall cry out in that day because of your king which ye have chosen. And the Lord will not hear you in that day. Now here's a sad thing recorded. Nevertheless, nevertheless, the people refused to obey the voice of Samuel. They said, nay, regardless We will have a king to reign over us that we also may be like all the nations. It's almost, it's almost beyond measure our understanding is how this could be. But how easy it it is for us to part from the divine ideal. How easy it is for us to make our request rather than wait upon God until He reveals what His will is, rather than being still, so that we might know what is the principle, what is the pattern that God has for us. Even the priesthood of Aaron was a departure from the divine ideal. Brother, we're not going to have much left, are we? Oh, yeah, we got plenty left. How do I know this? I know because what he told Moses before Sinai. And this may amaze you and you may have forgotten, especially its context. But this is what he says to Moses. All of you, a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel was God's perfect will. It was the divine ideal that all of Israel be a priesthood. The reason for the departure from this is explained by the Prince of Preachers, Dr. G. Campbell Morgan, in his book, God's Last Word to Man. It was his studies in Hebrews. Here's what he said. The nation never rose to the realization of that intention to the kingdom of priests. At the moment of original declaration, the people were afraid. Remember when they said, oh, Moses, don't let us hear what God's saying. You tell us what God's saying. At the moment of original declaration... The people were afraid as we continue our reading of that same 19th chapter. We find a change of tone in the message of God made necessary by the inability of the people to rise to the high ideal. And out of that, their inability to rise to the understanding and the intention of God, out of that, came a departure from the divine ideal, which was the priesthood of Aaron. God had wanted Israel to be a kingdom of priests. Now, if you have a kingdom filled with priests, and priests are to reconcile God and man by representing God to man and by representing man to God, who would have have to been, who was there left to be reconciled? Gentiles. If the whole nation of Israel was called to be the kingdom of priests, then who's left? The rest of the world. And that's their calling. Their calling is to be holy. Their calling is to, to respond to God's perfect will. God's perfect will was that they should reflect the nature of God. 
They were the chosen. For what purpose? To get God's intentions across to the rest of us. We were in darkness and we had no light at all. God wanted them to be our light. But before you become too proud, Gentiles, I heard a Methodist preacher in St. Paris, Ohio, stand one day and say this, say this and nearly shake the shoes off my feet. He said, God chose the Hebrews to represent Him in love to all mankind, and they refused. He then chose the church to do the same thing, and she too has refused. I said, where does God go from here? God's servant, Brother Ham, has given us the answer. God wants us to return to the divine ideal, which is a kingdom of priests. We must represent man to God and, and, and God to man. Jesus has done all of that through being our high priest. But he wants us as the body of Christ to do the same thing. That is the purpose of Jesus' high priestly prayer. High priestly prayer. I pray that they may be one. That they may be perfect in one. That the world may know that I have been sent. A kingdom of priests. A kingdom of priests that will not depart from the divine idea. A kingdom of priests that will wait upon God until they take no departures into secondary purposes and to other standards. Eugene Borovitz states that we Jews might be more inclined to give Christian claims some credence had we seen Christians through the ages behave as models of redeemed humanity. We're the hold up, even as Israel once was. The finger's on us, not her. A lot, our, a lot of our questioning is the desire to depart from the divine ideal. A lot of the questions we bring to the pastors and to those who seem somehow to have a special touch with God is because we're trying to get away from what we already know. And what we already know is that we're to wait upon God till God reveals Himself to us. And we don't want to do it because we don't want to take a cross. We may obtain answers... But with those answers in so far and to the extent that they depart from the divine ideal, they result in consequences, consequence of bondage which will not satisfy for that purpose for which you and I have been called. The thing we must guard against is the desire to depart. That's what we die out to. Waiting on God is the deliberate denial of the desire to depart from God's perfect will. That the motivator of these departures will be slain. Who's the motivator? The carnal nature. Who may depart from the perfect will of God, and by the skin of our teeth be saved. So the Bible says it can happen. And even have the evidence of God's hand with us, but still be as the children of Israel in the middle of a departure that is from God's perfect will with all the consequences upon our head in bondage and in slavery and wondering why we don't find the end result satisfactory. Nothing short of God's perfect will will satisfy. That's why we hesitate to promote anybody's personal ministry. One of the evidences that I have a valid ministry is that I don't have one. One of the evidences that I may be a true person is that I don't promote my own ministry. I promote someone else's. If I can't lose my life, my friend, what right do I have to ask you to lose it? If I can't lose my life in someone who's in touch with God moment by moment, what right do I have to ask you to lose it corporately or personally? I have no right. If I build my own ministry and everything hovers around this, I'm invalid at that point. 
I don't care how much evidence. I don't care how many people are saved. I don't care how many people claim sanctification. I don't care how much so-called glory hits the camp. Or what sprinkles of mercy may abide upon us. The validity of my ministry, if it is, if I am valid, that's not all. But this is one criterion, is that I point to another. And I keep pointing to another. And I must point to another. Because the easiest place for me to be lost is right here. No wonder an old time Church of God preacher told my daddy or told the, the Church of God folks when he looked in the hell, the greatest number of people in hell percentage wise that he saw were ministers. Because we're the most e- easily deceived and the most evil. Hiding under an umbrella of God's will. Hiding under a departure from the, statu- from the, from the uh, ideal, the perfect will of God. We take unto ourselves those things that only should be unto God and unto that which is appointed by Him, His representatives. And in so doing, we bring ourselves into bondage and we may build beautiful temples. And we may add greatly to our numbers. I want you to know it's unsatisfying so much so that as I look over religion for the last 2,000 years, I want no part of it whatsoever. They chose a king, but they also chose bondage. You and I may choose, but we cannot choose the consequences. They were led for 40 years, but they were led in circles. God wanted them in the promised land. And so he wants us in that promised land. Now I'll quit preaching and I'll meddle. That's the reason I send nearly all persons to Pastor Rod, because he exemplifies what I've told you here this morning. He's trustworthy. I've seen many people with gifts. I've many, seen many people with power. And a long time ago before I ever got to you, I was afraid of it. Because it, it would be off here and off here. Wrong answers here and wrong directions here. And I, I said, what is the matter with this? I find out that by God's grace, the principle of submission is greater than all the operations and all of the gifts. Being submitted unto God and his representative as long as that representative follows Christ. And so Paul was boldly heard to say, follow me. No. Follow me as I follow Christ. And I have not said that but maybe one or two times and I don't say it anymore. I didn't know any better. But Paul said it. The principle still the same. It is, in fact, the divine ideal. I would have you join yourself to these ministers. I would have you do like Keith did, as he's done to Pastor Rice. He's not here today. They're out of town for rest. But I would have, I would have you do as Pastor, as uh, Brother Keith has done under this man right here. I would have you join yourself to these men and this lady so appointed and join yourselves unto them. If you want to help me, you help them. Brother Helm says, if you want to help him, help me. I didn't say that. He said that. But that's what he said. He said that to you. And if you want to help me, since I'm in a position of two ministries, then you help these men right here. You help these teachers in these schools. You help what God's witness, and for goodness sakes, recognize that we have such a great, wonderful, and difficult ministry here that one needn't go anywhere else for the will of God. It's already been revealed. Be careful who you pray with. If you pray with Him, He's not going to tell you anything unless... A man of God, when it comes to location, when it comes to mate, or when it comes to destination or vocation, he isn't going to say it unless he knows for sure. But he will tell you to do this, wait and die. He doesn't get many callers on that subject anymore. It's because he's so honest and he's such an example. And so I've said, look and observe and listen and follow this example. 
and stay with these ministers that are endeavoring the best I know of anywhere to die and to do God's will and to find out what God's witnessing, what he's leading. Think of it several years ago, about 180 of you were going to the waiting upon God, and I felt a disturbedness in my soul. I said, I don't believe enough for responding. I didn't say it out loud. I just asked God's servant. I said, sir, without telling him what I felt or how many were going, I said, Brother Helm, I said, how many does God want at this waiting? So he prayed. And he said, well, uh, the Lord tells me somewhere between 240 and 250. Boy, I came back. I said, boys, pull out all the stops. Start calling. We don't want to grieve God at this point. We've come too far to turn back. I said, call the people, do what we can. We probably lost some out of that. But I want you to know at that waiting upon God, there were 240, somewhere between 240 and 250. And when you stood that day, how glad do you think I was? Because the Holy Spirit said, I want most of your people there. There were so many going, I think I thought we'd dismiss service. And I, and uh, because the amount that Jesus wanted was there. But the Holy Spirit said, no, you're to have service. And there were 105 here that Sunday morning. 250, 240, 250 there, and 105 here. And I had service that night. Rodney, how many did you have that night? Uh, it was a quite a group that night. But I want you to know that night, God blessed us good. I'm sure glad we didn't depart from the divine ideal. Because that night, a $10,000 check was put in the offering. And we paid some back bills with the 5000 and we put the other 5000 in the in the account because a few weeks later, the Holy Spirit was to operate that we were to surprise Jim Wright, and I couldn't tell anybody, and I couldn't raise any money, and we were to go to the Caribbean and surprise Pastor Wright and Virginia, and the money was already there. Oh, praise the Lord. Oh, I could, oh praise the Lord. Glory be to God forevermore. Most of our troubles, dear ones, it was the desire to depart from the divine ideal. And it was so far and to the extent that you and I depart from, God, from what God wants for our life. We get deeper and deeper into bondage. 